All right, 12 p.m. here on the East Coast. Good morning or good afternoon uh, to you all. Uh, and welcome to today's webinar, Enhancing State Cybersecurity with BitSight, Strengthening Education Agencies and Critical Infrastructure. Uh, we'll give everyone a few more minutes just to log in and settle in. Uh, we will start shortly. All right, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome in. Uh, my name is Brian Pierre. I am the Public Administration and Public Works Program Manager here with TD Cenex Public Sector, uh, where we accelerate public sector growth for technology companies. Before we get started, uh, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you are joining us uh, via a computer, you do have the audio and visual component here, but uh, if you are joining via, via phone, uh, you are missing out on the visual part of this presentation. Uh, no worries, because uh, this presentation will be recorded uh, for your convenience. So uh, if you do have any questions, do feel free to uh, message us in the chat uh, and any technical uh, issues. Uh, we will be able to assist you uh, from there. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, again, my name is Brian P. Ayer. Uh, I have a, uh, a master's degree in business, and I'm coming uh, here from TD Cinex, public sector, uh, just a year in uh, with uh, the TD Cinex team. Uh, but prior to that, uh, eight years uh, with uh, public sector in the city of New York, having worked at the mayor's office and various agencies and departments uh, throughout the city. And so bringing all of that uh, technical experience, all of that uh, uh, knowledge and insight uh, over to all of our partners here uh, uh, that are working with us at TD Cinex, including that of BitSight. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, when we are talking about uh, a technology like uh, what BitSight offers here, uh, we are talking about cybersecurity. And so uh, much like uh, the lack of security that you're seeing in that picture here on the left, um, we are now seeing uh, cybersecurity as the greatest threat to our country, according to two polls, one from uh, the Gallup poll and another from the Pew study, uh, saying that 84% uh, of respondents uh, here in this, the country rate cyber terrorism as a critical threat. It's over uh, global warming, it's over uh, international or geopolitical conflict, uh, uh, immigration, terrorism, nuclear weapons even. So uh, cyber terrorism and uh, the need for cybersecurity, highly important. Uh, next slide, please. And so we talk about the need for security. I mean, you do have your standard DDoS attacks, you have your phishing attacks, you do have your malware that follows through with that. Uh, ransomware is also huge as well, too. Um, we're seeing a lot of that going on. Your tech worker shortage is also a part of that, too, because now you don't have uh, as many uh, uh, workers and IT uh, departments are, are not fully staffed anymore. And that leaves uh, a lot to be desired, as well as AI. Uh, AI is a huge uh, part and component of all of this uh, because AI can go rogue and that can lead uh, to a lot of cybersecurity downfalls. The other thing I didn't mention or forgot to put on this slide as well too uh, is the infrastructure. We do have aging infrastructure and uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about 
uh, what the the initiatives that are being um, handed down, especially from the uh, White House and the federal government to update that infrastructure. But old and aging infrastructure, just in my experience as well, uh, is certainly uh, a security flaw. Uh, next slide, please. And so just for uh, just for time uh, commitments here, I mean, we could have gone through uh, all of those uh, uh, scenarios on that previous slide, but we'll be kind of focusing on ransomware and, and ransomware in particular, because we do see ransomware as uh, the biggest um, uh, cyber threat uh, to all critical infrastructures, particularly uh, in SLED governments. And so you can see here just on this slide, uh, based on uh, a, a study from Active Insurance Provider Coalition, ransomware grew by 27% in the first half of the year. And that's a huge, huge increase because we're talking about somewhere over $1.6 million per ransomware attack. And that's a 47% increase in, in just the last six months alone. And so that's going to continue to grow. It's forecasted to continue to grow as well. And if you compound it with all of those uh, security uh, flaws in that previous slide, uh, you're, you're going to see a, a bigger number there. Um, but something that's also uh, not being mentioned here, um, the, the silent, uh, uh, I guess, uh, consequence of all of this is that when you do have a uh, ransomware attack, uh, it might you might see the ransom uh, uh, number per se as the uh, the big uh, uh, downfall, and that's what's usually being reported in the news. But it's also because the slowdown in the work or or the uh, infrastructure being offline for a few days that takes that ransomware payment um, to a whole nother level because you're adding another payment or the stop loss uh, in the cost opportunities being lost from the infrastructure being offline. Uh, next slide. And so what ransomware typically looks like, it looks like a $4 million Dallas attack uh, where Dallas, the city of Dallas continues uh, to, to uh, kind of come out of that uh, attack. And that's still uh, ongoing as well. You're seeing the, uh, the National Student Clearinghouse, uh, the Education Department, uh, coming out of the move it flaw as well. That's a, a big, big issue there. We all know about the colonial pipeline that happened last year. Again, that's a, a big uh, attack on a critical infrastructure system. And that was offline for a few days and resulting in billions of dollars just from not just the ransomware attack, but all over uh, the cost all associated with that. Uh, Oakland uh, in February had a big ransomware attack, so big that uh, their employees were also attacked. And now you can imagine uh, just kind of waking up and seeing your information on a dark web being sold out uh, because, you know, you're just a, a faithful employee for the, the city of Oakland. And then it's even affecting uh, other sectors like uh, casinos and gaming departments where uh, even MGM is being affected uh, by a ransomware attack that was recently reported just a few weeks ago. Uh, next slide. And so uh, insurance premiums as well, just like those ransomware attacks, they've been going up, uh, increasing by 51%. Uh, year over year, just from last year alone. Uh, and so you couple that with the national cybersecurity strategy that was released in March by the White House. Um, all of these incentives there are just only going to make uh, cyber attacks more and more costly and more and more of a uh, a consequence and a responsibility for state and local governments all throughout the country. And so uh, there, it's the need to remove all adversary uh, countries from the technology supply chain, which is also part of that aging infrastructure that we spoke of, um, you, to promote a secure internet and digital identity efforts and encourage deeper international collaboration on enforcing norms of good cyber behavior, including by disrupting and pursuing cyber attack perpetrators. So all of those in initiatives there are all for the insurance part of the equation. Uh, next slide. And of course, uh, we all we ha all know about the uh, state and local government uh, cybersecurity grant program. That is the bipartisan infrastructure law that I wanted to talk about from a few slides earlier. And that law, um, outside of just uh, all things, uh, you know, cybersecurity, it does provide uh, funds for pretty much all state governments to update themselves and to be uh, part of a a, a more uh, uh, a more updated uh, infrastructure movement uh, all throughout the country. Uh, and of course, keeping up with all sorts of new technologies as well in order to enable a better constituent experience and government experience, administrative experience all over. So 
Uh, this program in particular, it provides a billion dollars in funding to state and local partners over four years uh, with $185 million available uh, in the last fiscal year. But this fiscal year is going to be $374 million, and it's going to result uh, in, again, a, a billion dollars in funding. 80% uh, of that is supposed to be sent down uh, to local governments, and at least a quarter of it goes to rural and tribal areas as well, too. So there is a, a huge uh, incentive there uh, for all levels of government uh, in all locations. Uh, we, we are seeing a lot of threats coming, particularly to uh, uh, smaller uh, state and local government administrations and of course tribal uh, administrations uh, out in the Midwest and other parts of the country. So um, all of those uh, things there are important to remember because uh, pretty much it's not about uh, what attack is coming, it's, it's almost when, it's almost uh, inevitable at this point. And so, the smaller guys as well uh, certainly need uh, the protection, and they are aware of that as well. Um, next slide. And so that uh, pretty much brings up the incentive of coming into BitSight. I do want to thank you for your time as well. You can see the two uh, uh, QR codes. Uh, the one on the left is for uh, TD Senec Public Sector. If you want to learn more about uh, TD Senex's public sector uh, offerings, and you can see that see that there, uh, the QR code on the left. Uh, you can also reach out to public sector at tdcenex.com. My QR code on the right, if you want my contact information and more information uh, from me about all these slides here being presented. Uh, again, a recording will be available uh, after uh, the presentation, uh, but uh, in, if you do want to just reach out to myself, uh, you can do so at Brian.pierre at tdcenex.com uh, for BitSight. Uh, though um, uh, we are going to kind of turn it over to uh, uh, what BitSight can do and what they can do about all of these issues that they did mention. Uh, I do want to bring in uh, our uh, VP of Government Affairs at BitSight, Mr. Jake Alcott. He currently serves as the Vice President for BitSight. And prior to BitSight, Jake served as Cybersecurity Attorney to the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee and U.S. House of Representatives Homeland Security Committee. He also consulted with Fortune 1000 executives on cyber risk management and served as an adjunct, ad, adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, with that, Jake Alcott, the floor is yours. Brian, thank you, um, and thanks for that. Thanks for that great overview too. Um, I do want to touch on a few things that you said, and um, you know, really. Ultimately, I think our goal today is to, you know, share some information with uh, attendees about, you know, some of the challenges that you're facing as cybersecurity leaders in states um, and how BitSight can be useful uh, to helping you address some of those things. So excited to be here, uh, excited to, uh, to jump right into the presentation. So um, can, we, can we turn to the next slide, please? So Brian did a great job of touching on, on on a bunch of these things, and I'll just maybe highlight um, a couple of the challenges that uh, that we see. So on the on the left hand side, there's a, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of bad stuff that is on the rise, and the way that I would describe that, as Brian said, a lot more incidents, cyber incidents that are affecting you know various departments and agencies within the government. Of course, we know that they're also affecting the enterprise as well. We're seeing a massive amount of Ransomware, as Brian uh, explained, that is having a very negative impact on school districts, counties, local governments. Um, lots of news about uh, critical infrastructure uh, across our states, whether it's electric utilities, energy companies, water facilities, et cetera. There's been a wide number of attacks targeting critical infrastructure. Brian mentioned uh, colonial pipeline, uh, many more. Uh, out there putting this infrastructure at risk. And then we're also seeing you know, those same uh, attackers going after uh, organizations in our supply chain, uh, whether it's uh, vendors, uh, contractors, IT providers that are um, you know, providing us uh, technology services or things like that. It could be a contractor that, that we're working with, other parts, other uh, areas of the supply chain increasingly at risk. So lots of bad stuff. Uh, that cybersecurity leaders are are focusing on, and then on the other side, you know, we're 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 facing a number of challenges um, in terms of understanding the attack surface. We're all relying more on 
IoT devices, on OT technology, on cloud infrastructure, on those organizations in the supply chain. And it's very hard for us to gather the visibility that we need into security issues, into incidents, into just an overall understanding of the attack surface, generally speaking. We're having a harder time measuring the effectiveness uh, of our program that we're building and being able to report that up to senior leadership, including uh, folks like the governor who are increasingly asking us questions about, you know, how is our cybersecurity performance? How are we doing? And the reason why they're asking that question is because there are so many incidents that are taking place. They're being asked uh, the same questions. And then, of course, you know, there's this sort of never ending challenge with, with respect to funding. I mean, of course, we would love to spend, you know, every last dollar that we have on cybersecurity to make sure that we're completely protected. That's just not reasonable. And we know that. And so cybersecurity is often a balance of, you know, making that risk management decision about, you know, things that I would uh, like to do, what should I be focusing on? How should I spend, um, you know, the limited amount of money that I do have? What, what can I get the best bang for my buck uh, with? And so funding is always a challenge. It's a challenge, not only by the way, for, um, for, for, state, um, for state leaders like yourself, but also, you know, we're seeing in the enterprise uh, too. You know, there's not an unlimited amount of money anywhere uh, to be spent on cybersecurity. And so we really have to be careful about, you know, how we spend our money and, and how we get the value uh, for the money that we spend. So next slide, please. So hopefully you think that these are also, you know, issues and challenges that, um, that, that you're seeing. Um, and what I want to, you know, do over the next couple slides is explain to you, you know, a little bit about how uh, we think BitSight can help. Um, we think that BitSight can enable state cybersecurity leaders like you uh, to confidently measure, manage, and report cyber risk, whether it's on agencies, critical infrastructure, school districts, counties, local governments, or even critical suppliers in your supply chain. We provide continuous visibility into security performance of any organization, including the ones that I just mentioned. And what we're really doing is we're providing you with visibility and meaningful validated analytics that are going to help you quickly understand um, the cybersecurity performance of organizations, the controls effectiveness that those organizations have implemented, and the likelihood that those organizations will experience an incident. We're going to provide you with accurate supply chain relationships that are going to help you understand concentration risk. You know, a lot of folks are, fo are thinking about, you know, we've got all of these different third party vendors. Um, maybe we have all these different third party vendors across all these different um, uh, state agencies. We're all leveraging Amazon Web Services. We're all leveraging this particular IT provider. How do we understand the depth of the connectivity that we have with those organizations? And then how can we understand the security posture uh, of those organizations as well? We're going to help you do that. Um, we're going to provide you the ability to share data um, with at risk organizations that's going to help them improve their cybersecurity performance. And then finally, you know, it is our goal to provide understandable reporting and visualization that's going to help you communicate with the leaders that you're working with to provide them with assurance that um, programs are working effectively or provide them with justification to spend more money. Uh, because that's another thing that you know, we increasingly see folks um, thinking about, which is, you know, how can I you know, best communicate what's happening to leaders so that, you know, we might be able to, um, we might be able to attract more money, we, we might be able to spend more money in, in, in other areas. Uh, so that's another uh, area that we're going to help you uh, uh, work on. Uh, next slide, please. So, so before we get into it, why BitSight? Thousands of organizations, including state agencies, government agencies, government policymakers, investors, insurers, and enterprises are all relying on BitSight's data to make mission critical decisions. One of the main reasons for that is that our ratings and analytics have been independently validated and they have meaningful correlation to cybersecurity incidents. What does that mean? That means that the data that we're providing to you is strongly correlated with the likelihood that one of these organizations that we're talking about is going to experience an incident. And so whether it's critical infrastructure within your state, whether it's third party suppliers within your uh, vendor uh, risk management program, whether it's state agencies that you're overseeing or you're working with, 
all of those uh, organizations that you think about that you're working with, we're providing analytics to help you understand their cybersecurity performance. And our analytics are validated and correlated to the likelihood of experiencing incidents. We have a really, really high quality cybersecurity data set that we work with, scanning our own infrastructure, leveraging our massive botnet um, uh, data collection um, capabilities, all of which provide us with insights into cybersecurity performance. And then we're using that data and we're taking that and we're mapping it against organizations. So we have a really unique approach to uh, essentially attack surface mapping, organizational asset mapping that is producing this very unique, very expansive, very differentiated visibility into organizations. And that's why more than 20% of global governments, we're talking about countries here around the world, and over 150 government agencies are using BitSight today. So next slide. I'd like to just explain really briefly what this uh, correlation uh, means and why it's so significant. So we spent a lot of time collecting this cybersecurity data and then um, uh, performing uh, analysis on what does that data actually tell us? What does it mean? And so in order to understand um, an organization's likelihood of experiencing an incident, you need to have two things. You need to have cybersecurity performance data, which gives you an indication about how that organization is performing over time. But then you also need incident data. You need uh, examples of incidents that have been disclosed or reported to agencies to help you match the two data sets together so you can understand are the things that I'm seeing, are they meaningful in understanding breach likelihood or incident likelihood? And we work with a lot of different third parties that have their own massive data sets of incident information. And we provide our security performance information so that those organizations can match those two data sets together. So one of the studies that we recently did is with an organization called Marsh McLennan, which is the world's largest insurance broker. Marsh McLennan uh, provides cyber insurance. Um, they're a, a major broker that provides cyber insurance policies to tens of thousands of organizations here in the United States and around the world. Marsh McLennan has a cyber risk analytics center. And what they do is they collect all of their cyber incident information that their customers uh, are sharing with Marsh McLennan. Their customers are experiencing incidents. They want to activate their cyber insurance policies. They're sharing that data uh, with Marsh in order to activate the, the insurance policies. Marsh McLennan recently did an independent study of BitSight data to find that 14 of the BitSight analytics that we're talking about, which includes the security rating and a number of different what we call risk vectors or performance vectors, are significantly correlated with cybersecurity incidents, which means that poor performance in patching cadence, in endpoint detection, in mobile software, in malware uh, infections, all increase the risk of experiencing an incident. And so what we want to do is we want to share that, um, share those analytics and share that data with you so that you can help make better decisions about your cybersecurity program. We think that one of the bases for that is to have this really meaningful, validated uh, analytics. And that's why we spend so much time doing this kind of analysis. Okay, I want to jump into a few case studies. So if we can just jump to the next slide, I want to just explain, you know, in a um, over the next few slides, just about how some state agencies are leveraging BitSight um, for some very important use cases and how some other government agencies are also thinking about it. And really what, I, what I'd like to focus on is, you know, there, there are sort of four major use cases that, you know, we think um, uh, you may be very interested in, in understanding and leveraging our data for. And I want to just, you know, kind of share some stories about each one of these. And the first is to oversee cyber risk across different state agencies. Excuse me. So we know that state CISOs are having a very challenging time uh, in understanding cybersecurity and cyber risk across a very disparate environment. You know, when we think of all these different agencies that maybe fall under the CISO's responsibility. So I wanna share a story about that. The second story I wanna share is about ransomware, which we've been talking about uh, a decent amount today. And I know that that's something that's very important to you. We're talking about how to reduce ransomware risk within government agencies. And the specific case study I'm gonna share is about school districts. The third um, uh, case study uh, that I'm going to talk about is 
the supply chain issue. How do we manage and monitor third party supply chain risk in an effective way? And then the last one is something that, you know, I, I'm really interested in sharing stories with you. I know that, you know, for a lot of states, you know, we have a challenge in, in sort of understanding critical infrastructure issues and critical infrastructure cybersecurity is something that we know is very important. Um, increasingly, our governors are sort of interested in this and focusing on it. And so I want to share with you a case study. It's an international case study, uh, but it's one that I think applies directly to, uh, to the states. So if that's okay, I'm going to you know, spend the next you know, 10 minutes or so just kind of walking through um, uh, each one of these and you know, kind of giving you a better idea about how organizations, um, whether they're state agencies or other government agencies, are using BitSight for these purposes. So let's just go ahead and jump to the next slide then. So, um, so I want to begin with, um, you know, thinking about uh, what is a, a large uh, U.S. state um, and how they use BitSight. So think of it this way. This is a massive um, state bureaucracy and infrastructure that the state CISO is responsible for. And when I say that, what I really mean is there are hundreds of state agencies each with their own IT, their own budgets, their own responsibilities, whether it's you know, the state tax department or the state DMV or the alcohol um, you know, um, beverage um, you know, agency, housing agencies, finance agencies, medical agency, safety, gambling, you know, you, you all who, who are dealing with this on a regular basis, you know just how diverse um, a state can be and, and sort of the different uh, state bureaucracies can be. So it's, it's a lot of stuff. And of course, everybody has their own sort of areas of responsibility. And in this particular situation, you have a state chief information security officer that's sort of responsible for overseeing um, a lot of these areas, but with limited authority. And, you know, th that's, that's not new. Uh, I know for some of you who have been, you know, security leaders for a long time, it's not new to, you know, have responsibility for a lot of stuff, but not really been given, you know, a, a ton of authority to, to, to do a lot of different things or to control budgets or, you know, to be able to, um, you know, change security um, features and measures and things like that. I think that those things are changing, but it's still, you know, we're still kind of operating in a, um, in an environment where, there's still a lot of, you know, kind of advice and consent that takes place. And so the CISO's job here is to really sort of oversee and understand cyber risk across, you know, what we would call a federated infrastructure, which means that, you know, everybody's kind of responsible for their own stuff. Um, but it's a CISO's job to sort of oversee all those things. We see the exact same thing, by the way, when we work with companies. You know, you have a, a large enterprise company with global business units, you know, a lot of, you know, you may have, you may be headquartered in the United States, for example, but you've got business units in, you know, in Europe and Asia and elsewhere, and they kind of all are running their own infrastructure, but you're sort of responsible for overseeing this. So we, we see this kind of federated model quite a bit. And so the challenge is, you know, how can we understand all of these different agencies attack surface Sometimes they want to share information with us, sometimes they don't. How can we gather that data consistently on a consistent basis? Can we develop metrics that will help us analyze you know, the effectiveness of the program? Can we highlight areas that we can improve the cybersecurity performance? You know, maybe there are some challenges in patching, for example, or maybe there are some other challenges with, we've got a lot of um, you know, devices that may be misconfigured or we have some open ports or exposures that, that may be posing uh, risk to us. You know, can we identify some areas uh, to improve? And then ultimately, you know, can we give um, our leadership, whether it's, you know, the state homeland security professional or the governor or somebody else, a sense of how this whole thing is working, is it working effectively? And so that's exactly what BitSight uh, is doing for this large um, state. We're providing them with visibility across 75 plus state agencies. We're providing them with standard understandable metrics, you know, including that security rating and the risk vector performance information that helps them identify strengths and weaknesses and recommending improvements. And then ultimately, you know, we're really trying to provide some easy, understandable reporting, easy to print off, easy to share with the governor, with executive leadership, 
uh, to help them understand how things are working and, and, and even to help understand where there are some challenges and where we need to make improvements. So um, very proud of that work uh, that we're doing with, um, with this one particular large US state. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we talked uh, about ransomware risk. And so this, um, this case study I'm going to share is with a, uh, with a US state that, like many, is facing a lot of ransomware incidents within their state. And in this particular situation, it's ransomware affecting school districts. Um, I know that my, my children uh, would love uh, to be out of school uh, for several weeks, um, but we don't want them out of school. We want them in school. Um, we want them in their learning, and we certainly don't want them out of school um, because a ransomware incident uh, has disrupted you know, operations in the local school district, but that is exactly what happened um, in this particular state. Kids were out of school for, for weeks. They also had other issues, you know, accidentally wiring money to fraudulent bank accounts, uh, for example. And so a lot of mistakes that were being made from a cybersecurity perspective in some of the you know, kind of local um, you know, school districts and, and uh, local, uh, local government agencies. And, and you, we understand why this is happening. I mean, there is not a lot of cybersecurity expertise, generally speaking, um, you know, across the board, much less, you know, it's obviously very hard to um, find a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, find a lot of great cybersecurity um, expertise inside of, you know, um, the you know, school districts and things like that, when you've got so many different things that you need to be doing in a in limited amount of um, uh, folks who, who are able to who are able to do those things. So what the state uh, chief information officer took on was taking on this challenge of how do we improve the cybersecurity of these school districts and counties so that they will not experience these uh, incidents moving forward? How do we work with them more collaboratively to help them improve? And so there was obviously, you know, one of the challenges that this, C this CIO had was that there were a lot of these incidents taking place. He had a lack of visibility into the security posture of the school districts. You know, again, no, you know, no authority to, you know, control these networks. Um, and so without that, you know, authority, um, you know, without that, that visibility, how, how can you really, you know, sort of understand what's happening and, you know, sort of make, make good decisions. So it's a lack of visibility and lack of specific cybersecurity expertise. So the plan was this, you know, how do we leverage BitSight in order to um, get a better sense for what is happening throughout our state and specifically with these local school districts? Can we share data, cybersecurity performance information with school districts? Can we provide them with these insights? Can we allow those schools to add additional information into the BitSight platform that will even further enhance the insights that we're able to get? And that's exactly what, what happened. The, the CIO shared um, information with the school districts, uh, uh, allowed them to come in and provide even more infrastructure information into the BitSight platform. This helped identify many different types of cybersecurity issues, whether they were vulnerability issues or infections or things like that. And then the school dist districts could take that information and remediate those issues. The, the, the CIO was able to track performance improvements. And, and by the way, not everyone improved. And, and that's okay. You know, I mean, part of, I think, one, one of the challenges here is, you know, we want organizations to continue to improve, but sometimes they don't have the resources or the people to, to, to actually get the job done. And, and that's where we can then start to make better decisions about, okay, we're seeing that, you know, these districts are still really struggling with this. Can we provide them with additional assistance or can we provide them with additional funding or additional support to help them improve in certain areas? And so that's exactly, you know, think of this as a decision making tool that can really help you not only better understand, you know, the, the risks, but where to prioritize those, you know, very sort of precious dollars that you have. Ultimately, all this data was taken to provide um, real time reports um, and ongoing reporting up to the governor. 
um, we were able to create some really compelling visualizations um, showing that you know performance improvement over time and even highlighting some of the areas that needed to be improved all of this was 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 really effective in not only reducing risk but also providing assurance uh, up the chain and then ultimately uh, this CIO was invited uh, to the White House to brief the White House on their program and um, the effective uh, the effective program that they were able to build and, and reduce um, risk throughout these school districts. So, really excited about that. I think it was you know just a, another great example of how you know data um, can be shared um, with with organizations who are at risk. They can improve themselves. You can track that. Uh, performance over time, and that was all enabled through the BitSite platform. Okay, I want to keep going here. We just have two more case studies, and then we can get to uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, so next slide, please. So we'll get into some of the named case studies right now. You know how sometimes, um, you know, organizations like to put their uh, their name against, um, uh, against uh, a, a case study that they've done. Sometimes, you know, they would prefer to to be anonymous. This is a great example of uh, an organization you've probably heard of, NASA, um, that really wants to talk a lot about the success that they've had with BitSight in part because they are really leading the way with respect to third party supply chain risk. And they really want to talk about it and they wanna share their story and they want more organizations to think about how they can leverage um, security performance information that BitSight is providing and others. Um, to make better decisions about their third-party risk program. So when you think about the challenge that NASA has, talk about a huge infrastructure. You know, we've got, you know, a, a, a giant infrastructure that NASA is operating, supercomputers all over the place, lots of different stuff going on here. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of different vendors. You also, it's interesting, you also have a, a federated model uh, we were just talking about a couple minutes ago. You know, NASA sort of has the same the same kind of model. Um, they have a lot of different um, you know regional centers that sort of operate their own infrastructure. So NASA also has a federated um, model uh, for their for their security leaders as well. They have a lot of statutory requirements um, to oversee and manage uh, supply chain risk. They have a lot of sensitive data, as you can imagine, and they had this ultimately this challenge about you know we've got a lot of um, third party suppliers, third, third party vendors that we believe may be at risk, uh, um, maybe it may, may have may have cyber risk issues that it's very difficult for us to understand because our risk assessment process was took a long time. It was hard. Um, uh, it was producing data, you know, in a very irregular um, manner and so how can we you know improve that risk assessment process and then how can we you know implement some continuous monitoring uh, along the way and so you know ultimately they realized that they needed an automated approach and so we're very proud to partner you know with NASA um, to uh, to help them uh, implement a more automated approach to third-party supply chain risk and you know the results of it have been fantastic for NASA 50 percent time savings uh, with automated security monitoring. This cut down on so many other aspects of their program, whether it was hours spent traveling to do risk assessments or you know, just the challenges of you know, being able to sort of sift through questionnaires and you know, other, um, you know, other ways of collecting this, this data, leveraging you know, more automated risk assessment function was really important for them. Uh, it's accelerated their their risk assessments as well. You know, we've moved from you know risk assessments that may have taken months and months and months and months to now we can really focus on uh, you know getting real time information. Can prioritize organizations that may be at higher risk that we want to spend more time focused on. NASA has been able to uncover a bunch of different high risk vendors uh, that they might not have known about in the past. Some of which uh, may be using banned services under section 889 of the national defense authorization act this would involve you know some uh foreign equipment that that those organizations were not allowed to uh, were not allowed to use and so it's again being able to understand not only my security posture but all these different third-party relationships and uh, hardware and software vendors that my third parties may be using which is you know a fourth party risk to me and really just a better understanding about the exposure 
that the agency faces uh, as a whole. So very proud to be working with NASA on all these issues. Um, uh, if you can just jump to the next slide, our um, uh, our main point of contact there is Kenitra Tyler, who manages the supply chain risk management program at NASA. And Kenitra says that you know I can think of at least three instances where BitSight alerted to us alerted us to major security issues that could affect NASA, so that we would be better prepared. In each instance, BitSight provided us with detailed reports and advice that allowed us to make better decisions while protecting our supply chain. That's what it's all about. Uh, it's about identifying risks, being able to react to those. Uh, quickly and reducing the likelihood that we'll experience an incident. So very proud to work with uh, Kenitra and the broader team uh, on this issue. Next slide, please. So the last one I just wanted to mention here is um, related to the Belgium Center for Cybersecurity. And you know, I just want to be clear, BitSight is working with many different U.S. agencies and states. We work with uh, federal agencies that are focused on the critical infrastructure protection mission. I'm sharing this because you know, I, I'd, I'd love to, to hear your feedback uh, on this. You know, we know that governors are increasingly thinking about this critical infrastructure protection uh, mission and, you know, what are they responsible for and, and what are, you know, what are their security leaders, you know, responsible for and how does the state mission sort of different from the national mission a little bit. And I just, I wanted to, to share this, um, this case study with you because you know, we think that this is really where things are are moving. We certainly see them moving um, uh, elsewhere, and I and I wanted to share this as as an example of things that we think that we could absolutely uh, be doing to help you uh, in your state with when it comes to critical infrastructure. So, so the the Center for Cybersecurity in Belgium is the is the national cybersecurity authority in Belgium. They're responsible for critical infrastructure cybersecurity in Belgium. And their problem is that they really had no idea what was going on with respect to Belgium's national cybersecurity posture, which included critical infrastructure. Again, these were organizations that were private sector organizations. They did not necessarily share information uh, with um, the Belgium uh, Cybersecurity Center, yet they had this mission where they needed to understand cybersecurity across the critical infrastructure. And this is the same thing with states. You know, what happens if our electric utility goes down because of a cyber attack? It, it affects us uh, in the state. You know, what happens when our when our water facilities are disrupted? Um, it affects us in the state. And so, um, so Belgium, you know, like like other governors today, you know, really felt like they had to, you know, take some actions to better understand security performance and then do something about it. And so um, today, Belgium uh, uses BitSight uh, to understand the cybersecurity performance of um, hundreds of different organizations with that critical infrastructure mindset, and they have plans to to quadruple that in the near future. And just to kind of give you a sense for, for what's happening. So they, they use BitSight data to understand cybersecurity performance, the vulnerabilities, the infections, you know, how are we doing with respect to, you know, different elements of our program, et cetera. What they're also really looking for is when a new vulnerability comes out, they want to be able to issue an alert or a warning. They call it a spear warning. Uh, procedure and that's you know an email that they send to impacted organizations about an infection or about a vulnerability the reason why they're doing that is they want this rapid remediation so like an example of this is there's a hospital you know during covid that had a low bit site rating and so they were concerned that this was an organization that was at greater risk well then they observed that this is an organization that also was experiencing several vulnerabilities so using that information, they alerted the hospital's executive management team, and that team was then able to prioritize, you know, investment and resource to address that issue. And you know, from the from the CCB's point of view, that was great because you know that improved the hospital's security performance, and it reduced the likelihood that they would experience an incident. So it's these, excuse me, it's these kinds of interactions that BitSight is really helping to facilitate between, you know, um, uh, cybersecurity leader and um, critical infrastructure organization uh, entity today. And that's kind of what we're what we're getting at. In another example, you know, Belgium had discovered that there were over 2,500 
RDP uh, access points uh, that were exposed throughout the country. You know, and they felt that that was, you know, that, that, that was a serious risk because, you know, RDP was is often exploited by attackers. And we've seen that time and time again. So they were actually able to specifically work with one particular service provider. Um, in this case, it was a telecom service provider. And that telecom service provider was able to address nearly 75 percent of the RDP um, exposures that were taking place within the country. And that was great because, you know, it's like I can contact this one organization, they can, you know, address these issues immediately, and now we don't have exposure. So I'm sharing these stories with you because, you know, we really think that this is, <clears throat> excuse me, th this is an area that more and more governors are focusing on, they're interested in this. Um, it does represent significant risk to, to states. And, you know, I just want you to know that this is this is not an impossible problem. You know, I think that, you know, historically, you know, um, we might have thought that this was a, a, you know, very significant challenge. And maybe this is something that, you know, we, we can't really take that on because we, we have no idea where to start. And, you know, isn't somebody else doing that? And what I'm suggesting to you is I, I really do think that this is something that um, security leaders within states are, are increasingly thinking about. They're trying to figure out what they can do and I just want you to know that BitSight can be a really good partner um, for you in helping you address some of these issues. So um, listen, I, I, wanna, I wanna stop there. I, um, I wanna thank you all so much for, um, for your interest um, in, in what we're doing. And, and like I said, I, I really do hope that we uh, will have the chance to be able to work with you uh, to help you tackle any one of these uh, particular um, uh, case studies that, that you may be focusing on internally, or maybe there's something else that you think we can help with, and, and we'd love to do that for you. So uh, I will stop there. Um, Felicia, thank you so much for uh, controlling the uh, the slides along the way, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I know Brian feels the same way. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, let's see here. Um, if you have some time, we do have some questions, um, and we can go through those. Um, and then we can go ahead and close it out for the day. Um, so, and I'm not sure if you guys want to, you know, respond separately from the TD Cynic side as opposed to the Bit site, but we can kind of go through these. Um, so, can a cyber incident have an impact on credit ratings, worthiness for government entities that experience um, a breach or other incidents? Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it's not just the enterprises that we see that are that are feeling this uh, financial impact. Um, ju just a couple of weeks ago, um, Moody's, which is a, a, a BitSite partner, actually put out a study that that showed the link between um, cybersecurity performance and and financial performance and financial risk. And basically the Moody study um, shows that organizations that experience cyber incidents experience um, other financial impacts as well. And that, and, and that includes impact to, to their credit worthiness. Um, and that is particularly acute in the state and local government context. You know, state, states are um, often issuing um, you know, debt, um, bonds, et cetera. And when a state or a local government experiences an outage, a cybersecurity incident, et cetera, that actually does um, and is increasingly starting to have an impact on the way that the market views their reliability in being able to reissue uh, or issue that, um, I should say, repay that debt. So, um, so I think if, if you are a, a cybersecurity leader in, in a state, you know, you also need to be thinking about, you know, these incidents that could affect um, my state may also affect our ability to borrow money in the future. And I think that that's maybe, maybe one of the reasons why governors are, are really sort of focusing on this and financial leaders within states are sort of focusing on, on some of these issues as well. 
Yeah, I totally agree, Jake. Um, I would I would add to uh, your market analysis there by saying it's not just the the market views, but it's also uh, the constituent view of the government. Um, it, it's part of the digital experience. Um, and so uh, if you're a constituent of a, a state or a local uh, entity um, where a cyber attack has happened, uh, you are more likely to uh, want to uh, disassociate from the government and and you 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 don't want to necessarily follow along with any of their initiatives because you just believe that your uh your you know taxpayer dollars are just being are going to be spent for uh some sort of ransomware or malware attack that has happened that should have been protected against so uh you certainly want that to to not be the case uh, and uh, you you're going to see um as a result of that if you you're not paying attention to your cybersecurity risk. Uh, you're going to see uh, a lot more of those um, uh, that revenue that you would get uh, from being a, a government entity start to go down um, uh, significantly uh, after creditworthiness and uh, more just more breaches happen uh, in the future because they inevitably be, they inevitably will happen uh, if you're not protecting yourself. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Um, and Jake for, you know, giving some more insight on that. Um, I do have a couple more if we're good with that. So um, are more state CIOs or CISOs being tasked with understanding and mitigating risk to critical infrastructure in their states? Um, second part to that is how are they addressing that risk? Um, I, I'm happy to take this and then uh, Brian, please feel free to um, to jump in as well. So I think it, um, it, it, it feels to me like it's 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 a bit varied uh, within within the states today, and you know I've seen um, a couple um, a couple examples recently where you know some states have you know sort of created a um, cybersecurity leader uh, within the state, which is actually separate and apart from the from the CISO um, role. And I don't know that that's necessarily a, um, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily a position that that every that every state will create. But I, I think what I've what I've read is that the reason why a couple of those states created that role is to, you know, kind of address this critical infrastructure um, issue, which you know was viewed as being separate and apart from you know some of the IT um, uh, issues that are associated with you know the state agencies, for example. So. Um, I think it does vary uh, state by state. I would love to hear, um, you know, folks on the call, you know, weigh, weigh in on this to, to hear what, what you're seeing in, in your own state. Um, again, I think that, I think, I think that this has always been an issue that has been discussed, um, between, you know, governors and homeland security, uh, leaders within states. Um, but again, historically, you know, I think that, Folks kind of thought, eh, hey, we don't really, we don't really know how how exactly to to tackle that, you know, using using data or you know using uh, technology, and you know that's what I I think I'm suggesting is that's 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 a new and emerging um, thing that um, you know we at Bitsight can can help out with. So Brian, I'll turn it over to you if you had any observations as well. Yeah, um, and I think uh, I probably will answer uh, your question, Jake, just on behalf of all of the. Uh, 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 all of the uh, audience here um, is is that we've been seeing a whole of state cybersecurity approach where the entire state, not just the state C, uh, CIOs or and CISOs, are uh, tasked with uh, mitigating all of that risk, but the entire state as a whole, uh, in partnership with their their counties, their uh, cities, municipalities, and jurisdictions, all coming together. Um, for that uh, cybersecurity approach. And, and uh, we're seeing that partnership kind of, uh, um, you know, pretty much be transferred through uh, throughout the entire country. And it's, it's, a, it's a strategy right now that is uh, pretty much working. It, it does work to, to help limit uh, the amount of malware and, and attacks that are happening, um, especially when you, you start to, uh, to remember that there are a lot of smaller uh, parts of a state that uh, are, are pretty much, you know, just waiting to be attacked and are waiting to, uh, to you know, see the risks actually happen. So um, that kind of approach there thus far is being 
uh, reciprocated through uh, through many different uh, states and many different regions in the country, and it seems to be working pretty well right now. Yeah, um, Brian, if I could just you know kind of add add to that, you know, I, first of all, that, I think that's I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, there's always, there's always kind of, you know, somebody who's, you know, sort of spent, spent their career, you know, kind of working, um, you know, in and around, you know, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security um, uh, and working on some of these homeland security issues, you know, there's, there's always sort of been this, this question about, you know, what should, what should the federal government be responsible for? What should the states be responsible for? How should those two, you know, different um, levels of government you know, collaborate uh, together to, you know, to address, you know, cybersecurity issues within the state, you know, who's, who's, who's in the best position, you know, quite frankly, to, to be able to, um, uh, to, to do that. And, you know, I, I, I feel like I have um, seen a movement towards, you know, greater sort of state involvement in understanding and managing some of those cyber risks in part, because, you know, and Colonial Pipeline might have been, you know, might have been a great example of this and, and others, you know, when, when a critical infrastructure event occurs within uh, the United States, it affects a, you know, ten, thankfully, it only affects a smaller part of the population. We, we tend not to see these national level um, cyber, cybersecurity incidents, um, although, you know, we can certainly imagine what those might look like, but they really have a lot of impact on um, state and local constituencies, Brian, as, as you were saying. So really, you know, I, I really think that that because of that, uh, state leadership and you know, local leadership is is crucial in being involved. And then, you know, the, the really the main question that I think a lot of folks need to ask is, OK, well, if we're going to be involved, how do we how do we measure the effectiveness of what we're doing? You know, how do we know what we're doing is working? Because we don't just want to have a bunch of meetings. Like we actually like want to fix stuff. We want to improve the risk. And that's really where you have to bring data to that, to that conversation. You can't just show up and, you know, have some meetings and, you know, everybody sort of walk away and say, okay, you know, like, yeah, we're, we're all going to work on it now. You know, it's really, you know, you're seeing a lot more focus on, you know, accountability and metrics and measurements. And, you know, that's why we're, we're really excited to, you know, to help, you out with um, with some of these um, with some of these challenges because we know um, what it what it takes to kind of bring people together you know using data for that purpose. Fantastic, thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, and so we have a couple more, but I'm going to go with this last one here, um, just for time's sake. How many countries are using your national cybersecurity solution? Can it be used by states as well? And I think you've touched on it a little bit, maybe just some clarification around that. Yeah, um, no, we have, um, I, I wanna say it's, you know, it's over, so it's over 20% of um, global, global governments, um, in, in other words, countries um, uh, that use, that use uh, BitSight for this purpose to better understand, you know, cybersecurity performance within within their own country, and that's usually focused on critical infrastructure, um, and that includes, you know, Israel and Belgium and the United States and 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 many others. Um, and yes, it it absolutely uh, can can be used uh, by states. In fact, you know, some some states are 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 using um, are using BitSight for that for that purpose. So. Um, uh, if, if this is interesting to you at all, please, please, you know, please reach out and you know, be happy to kind of share more information about it. So thanks. Thanks, Felicia. Thank you. And thank you, Jake and Brian, for um, your time and sharing your expertise today. Um, and thank you to all those who joined. Um, as a reminder, today's session was recorded and will be available within a week. Um, this does conclude our webinar for today. Thanks again for attending, and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks all, appreciate you.